the first words spoken by astronauts in space before history is made, big or small, is Houston. NASA's Johnson Space Center has served as the iconic setting to some of humankind's greatest achievements. For 60 years, our center has been the world leader in human space exploration. On May 25, 1961, President John F. Kennedy committed the nation to achieve the goal of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth before the end of the decade. NASA's Space Task Group, in charge of America's human spaceflight program, was already working on Project Mercury to put astronauts into Earth's orbit. But with the additional task of a human lunar landing, it soon outgrew its facilities at NASA's Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia. The agency decided it needed a dedicated field center for human spaceflight. And on September 19, 1961, after evaluating multiple sites around the country, NASA announced that the new manned spacecraft center would be built in Houston. You may have noticed we have already begun celebrating our 60th anniversary with a new logo and through a series of articles featuring aspects of the Space Center's history. We have even more planned throughout this celebratory year. Activities will include panel presentations, the installation of 60th anniversary light pole banners, social media posts about our history, merchandise emblazoned with the anniversary logo, a slideshow of JSC through the decades, a podcast reflecting on JSC's history, Build and Nine catwalk tours and mission operations control room tours, videos, and more. This will all be capped off by an in-person event in spring 2022, COVID-19 permitting. JSC has made many giant leaps throughout the past 60 years. We fulfilled President Kennedy's goal of landing a man on the moon, and today we reach further into the stars as we push forward to the moon once again, and then on to Mars. For more than 20 years, we have successfully continuously crewed the International Space Station, and we have so much more to accomplish with our Orion and Gateway programs. We continue to make history every day because of each of you. Let's take time to celebrate this milestone, both by looking back at what we as a center have accomplished, but also by looking forward to what's to come. Today, we push forward to the moon. Tomorrow, we leap to greater heights and new destinations. There is history to be made. In Mission Control, we eagerly anticipate the first transmissions from unexplored worlds. Hello, welcome to our celebration of NASA's 60 years in Houston. From JSC's External Relations Office, I'm Nilo Ramji. In 1961, the NASA Administrator announced the completion of a location study which founded the new Manned Spaceflight Laboratory would be located in Houston, Texas on 1,000 acres of land to be made available to the government by Rice University. Well, the name changed to the Manned Spacecraft Center by the time it opened for business and years later to the Lyndon B. Johnson Space Center and it has served as the home of human spaceflight in the United States ever since. Every single American spaceflight with people on board since Gemini 4 in 1965. As we look forward to the next 60 years, we really aim to focus on how Johnson Space Center's 60 year history is propelling us forward to the moon and onto Mars. There are many teams who work to ensure that this is a reality. Today, we have representation from the International Space Station, Commercial Low Earth Orbit, Gateway, Orion, and JSC's History Office. I'm going to let each of them introduce themselves, what they have to do, what they do, sorry, and in honor of the anniversary we're celebrating today, I'd love for each of you to tell us your earliest memory of JSC. Ryan, why don't we start with you? Thank you, and thanks for the opportunity to do this today. I'm Ryan Prouty, and I am the representative here on this esteemed panel from Space Station. I am currently managing the research integration office and I've started in flight control, have done a plethora of jobs through the space station program um, and even spent some time at the center level working on vision and strategy. So 
I'm going to cheat a little bit. It's not my earliest memory, but I think probably the most poignant when you're looking at the history of JSC and where we're headed, given a lot of the conversations we've had over the last couple of years, but it was about circa 2001 and I was a flight controller on console, I think during expedition three and Sally Davis was the flight director on console and she got on the loops and she said, I need all of you to stand up and meet me on the airwaves. We were like, ah, what's happening? So we all stand up and then just in the room, she says, I need all of you to look around you. We did. We're all looking, you know, we're all college kids pretty much. We're looking around and she said, this is the first time in history all women have been flying a spacecraft. I want you to remember this. So anyway, I do. Uh, and that was one of my favorite memories. That's very inspirational. Camille, you're up next. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me, first of all. I'm Camila Lane. I'm the deputy manager for the Commercial Leo Development Program. And my earliest mem memory of JSC, I actually, I've only been at JSC for 14 years, I believe. I, I think I'm going on 15. But I actually came to JSC before then because I was uh, back years and years and years ago. I was a finalist for the astronaut selection. And so I got to be invited to come down and interview and just being able to um, go to the sixth floor in building four south and meet the other astronauts was just like incredible. And um, that for me was my first memory of being even associated with uh, Johnson Space Center. Amazing. Thank you so much, Camille. Glad you're here with us today. Uh, next up, we have Rod Jones. Rod? Well, thank you very much. My name is Rod Jones. And um, I'm currently the Gateway Vehicle Systems Integration Manager, and we're responsible for pulling together all the systems within the Gateway elements to make sure it works as a cohesive spacecraft. I started at JSC in 1984, and it's hard to remember back that <laughs> what impressed me back then, but I think what is, what is absent today is what I remember the most. I was in an office, it was called the Man Systems Division, and it was um, in the human or in the you know, science, life sciences directorate at the time. And the folks in that division were really interesting to me. I came to JSC to work on the architecture and design of the inside of a space station. And all the folks in that division were associated with the equipment the crew lived with, the food they ate, the cameras they used, the equipment, the clothes they wore. And I got to sit in the in the same floor with people like Rita Rapp. Now Rita was the food lead, and she had packed every meal for the crew since Mercury. I mean, the original brown paper bag sack lunches. She went to the store, bought the food, made the sandwiches, and packed it. And so, listening to her anecdotes all the way up through shuttle and how that technology changed was was really um, impressed me a lot. And that's my my fondest memory. I think most impressed. Thank you. Thanks, Chuck. And five. Oh, thanks, Rod. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself here. And now let's hear from Chuck Dingle. Chuck? Yeah. Hi. Thanks for uh, having me uh, on the, uh, today. So, yeah, my uh, I'm uh, currently the Orion uh, Program Chief Engineer. My uh, first memory of JSC goes back uh, literally to when I was, I don't know, just a few years old. Uh, JSC has been it's been part of my life for literally all my life. I Grew up in the Houston uh, Clear Lake area. Uh, my dad worked uh, at JSC. Uh, and my older sister also worked here at JSC. As a kid, I was uh, totally captivated by the Apollo missions. Uh, just uh, couldn't turn off the TV uh, back then. I uh, went to college here uh, locally, went to the University of Houston, got a bachelor's uh, in electrical engineering started at JSC in 1983 in um, first third of my career in FOD, uh, first training uh, crews and then simulators, then as a flight controller. Uh, then I went to engineering uh, to work on the X-38 project as the environmental systems development lead, took on um, kind of more and more uh, responsibilities, uh, kind of got into the chief engineer line and I've uh, been working on Orion since it started in 2004 and various technical leadership roles and now program chief engineer. Wonderful, rich history with NASA. So speaking of history, finally we have John Yuri. John? Hi there, thank you for having me this afternoon. Uh, so I'm the manager of the JSC History Office 
I've been at JSC for 34 years, and my first memory, actually, I was here as a tourist. And this was back in the day in 1984 when tourists were allowed to just walk around campus between the buildings. It wasn't such a secure facility. And I just remember walking around and looking at the buildings that I'd seen on TV and read about. And I think that day I decided that I needed to come and work here. And so three years later, 1987 is when I first started here at JSC as a contractor. I've been here ever since. Most of my career was working in the science areas. So I worked the shuttle Mir program. Then I worked in the International Space Station program in the payloads office, which is now the research integration office that Ryan heads. And then about five years ago, I came over and, and started running the history office because there was a need to resurrect the history office at that time. And so I've had a lifelong interest in space history and of course of JSC's history. And I've been doing that for five years and it's been fantastic. Amazing. This is already so much fun. I think collectively, there's well over 60 years of experience with this group. So let's take a moment to look back. And John, I have a question for you. As the manager of the history office, can you tell us a little bit about what the history office does and how it's continued to preserve JSC's memories? Sure. Well, preserving NASA's history is actually in, in the agency's charter. So it's something we're obligated to do. Um, the JSC History Office has been on again and off again for the last 60 years. For the last five years, it's been very much on. Uh, we do a lot of things to preserve our history. Uh, the biggest project we've had going on since the late 90s is our oral history project, where we actually talk to individuals who are what, still here at JSC. Some have retired, and we get the history of what they did in their own words, their own experiences. So it's a very personal way to, to collect the history. Now, we do a lot of other things too, but right now we have about 1,400 oral histories, and these are accessible to everyone. Uh, we manage the JSC History Portal, which is a public website, and the transcripts of all of these oral histories are on that website, in addition to lots of other information about the history of JSC in particular and NASA as well. We have uh, mission transcripts. We have editions of the JSC Roundup from 1961, from the very first edition that appeared November 1st, 1961. All of those have been scanned in and we have them on our portal. And we just have other information that is available to researchers both here within NASA for use. You know, if they want to find out how things were done in a previous program to help them with current and future programs, they can go to the site and uh, and find that information. And we also support outside researchers, whether it be universities uh, who are looking to write histories uh, around the Apollo 11 anniversary back in 2019. Uh, we had a lot of interest and a lot of researchers came to us looking for very specific information. Uh, these are the people that did the documentaries and the motion pictures that dealt with that with that anniversary. So, uh, yeah, there, go out there and look at that website. There's lots of great information there to be had about JSC's history. That's fantastic. I bet you have some stories to tell based on those 1400 oral histories. Wow. I can't I, I have a follow up question for you now. Do what's the most memorable uh, interview you had or memorable story someone's told in that? Well, I, th I think some of the ones that are the most memorable is, you know, we got to interview people like Neil Armstrong. So we have his oral history on our website. A lot of the other Apollo astronauts, uh, some of the people we even went back to, you know, NASA's predecessor organization, the NACA. And we've interviewed people from back in the 50s of what things were like even before NASA existed or before JSC existed here. So. Uh, and it's and it's not just the famous people. We also have some engineers that worked out there and you know in the bowels of the buildings to get their stories. So it's not just the managers and the astronauts and the directors. It's we try to get a, a broad spectrum uh, across the board of people who worked here at JSC. Definitely, and I believe that that will really <clears throat> shed light on JSC's history and really help tell our story. So. You know, JSC has had a hand in several areas of human spaceflight, and one of those areas is with the International Space Station program. <clears throat> Excuse me. Ryan, building the International Space Station made the last 21 years of continuous human presence in space possible. Can you speak to some of the key areas of achievement that have added to the legacy of JSC? Oh, it's an inter interesting way you wrote that question, right? That the word that really jumps out to me is legacy, right? There's a difference between um achievements or, or things that we did but there's this legacy that any legacy of iss is going to be a legacy of jsc as the home for human spaceflight um 
the first one that comes to mind is just how much we have learned about the advancement and achievement for how to do research in space. Um, lessons that will help us in our further exploration to the moon and to Mars. Um, at the core, however, I think there are legacies in, in the people and in the culture that his, I'll say history will mark, maybe John will mark, um, at JSC that really do work to propel us to the future. Um, clearly technical competence, ISS is the largest international technical achievement of its kind ever. Um, the type of leaders that we've um, grown and um, taught in this long duration program in program integration and how to balance risk for the long haul, right? It's We didn't do short little sprints. We have been doing a marathon with little sprints on top of it along the way. And it's, right, a, diff right. it's, it's a different way to think about risk. And I think that's a skill that we've built for the whole center. Um, Cross-center collaboration station would not be possible with help and work from every single center across the agency. Um, one of my, I believe at, at its core will be one of the largest standing legacies is our international collaboration and space leadership on the world stage. It's the, the international piece is what brought me here was to get to work um, doing something that was you know bigger than me, but um, at, an, at an international level. And then lately, I'll, I'll say a new legacy that, that we're just leaning into is leading the way for building a commercial economy in low earth orbit. This is not something I thought I would be doing when I started before we even flew the first element. So I think there's a lot in there. Definitely, there's a lot to unpack there too, and I hope we can get more into that. Um, you know, everyone everyone definitely nodded when you said commercial low earth orbit economy, and the International Space Station has really helped us kick that off. So Camille, since Commercial Leo is a recent undertaking at NASA, can you talk a little bit about its goals and aspirations? Absolutely, I'm delighted to. It's one of my favorite topics. <laughs> So, um, so as you said, Commercial Leo Development Program is one of the newest programs at the agency. And of course, we are housed here at, at, at Johnson Space Center. But we are responsible for creating and enabling a sustainable and robust marketplace and economy in Earth orbit beyond the International Space Station um, when it's, it comes to um, it's the end of its life which we are now scheduled for 2030. Um, but our office is enabling the next, the next low Earth orbit platforms, right? That will be owned and operated not by NASA, which the International Space Station is, but owned and operated by commercial companies and commercial providers. And the reason for that is that we want to, one, have a sustainable presence in low Earth orbit, as a nation, but NASA also has goals to continue to do research in microgravity environment, right? Using these platforms as a technology testbed for exploration, continuing to do human research, um, uh, you know, on the research on the human body and how the adaptation of space impacts the human body. And so we are still gonna have these needs for Earth orbit research. And so we are going, we hope to be one of many customers of these commercial platforms. But in the process, right, we, we talk about an economy. When we talk about economy, there's a supply and there's demand. And that commercial platform is the supply side. But we are also doing things now using the international space space station to stimulate the demand and and ryan touched a little bit on that but things like private astronaut missions as part of that stimulating the demand the commercial use for advertising marketing and entertainment of the iss is part of that demand so we're not just enabling the supply with these commercial uh, platforms but we are also stimulating demand so that there's a robust marketplace um, at the end 
Definitely. And it, it allows us to explore our universe more than ever. And, you know, speaking of universe, we're, we're going back to the moon or forward to the moon and onto Mars. So let's talk a little bit about Orion. Uh, Chuck, would love to hear from you on how past JSC work on Apollo has contributed to Orion and how and when Orion got started. There's a rich history there. OK, yeah, uh, let's see. So you can you know, just take a look at Orion and you can tell that we certainly leverage some specific uh, aspects of uh, the Apollo uh, program, uh, the, you know, architecturally having a separate crew module, service module, uh, launch abort system, uh, the shape of the crew module, you know, physics stays the same between uh, decades, so um, physics kind of dictates uh, the shape is an appropriate one for the mission that we're flying. So um, uh, we obviously leverage that. Uh, we tweak the shape just a little bit, but uh, not so much that we couldn't use the Air Sciences database that was developed uh, back as part of the Apollo program. Uh, we leverage certain things from Apollo like um, the TPS, the thermal protection system uh, material on the base heat shield of the crew module. It's a little bit different than Apollo. We, we currently put it on in, in blocks instead of filling individual uh, honeycomb cells, but the, the Avcoat material is essentially uh, the same material that was flown on Apollo. Um, you know, our analysis uh, tools and the platforms they run on are certainly different and, and, and upgraded. But some of the core techniques that we uh, used uh, for our, uh, engineering uh, analyses, we leveraged uh, from Apollo. Uh, some of the ops techniques obviously be, uh, began back uh, in Apollo. And I would just say, um, you know, just uh, generally, you know, across the entire team, there's an uh, enormous body of knowledge uh, that was established um, you know, back from back from Apollo. You know, in terms of how Orion uh, got started, um, you know, so after the Columbia accident, I think the country uh, came to the realization that uh, the NASA man uh, human space flight program, we needed a different mission, we needed a different uh, vehicle. I think it was January of uh, 2004 that uh, President Bush announced, I think they called it the, the vision for space exploration and said uh, we're going back uh, to the moon. So as part of that, the uh, CEV, the crew exploration vehicle uh, was born, uh, later became uh, known as Orion. And the focus started a lot on the uh, CEV spacecraft itself. Uh, we organized a team, uh, stationed that team at headquarters to write an RFP, a request for a proposal. Uh, it led to a contract award for two um, competing um, teams. Uh, so we and uh, we awarded the two teams. So we were uh, off and running with a prime uh, contractor. Uh, shortly after that, uh, Mike Griffin came in. Uh, Dr. Griffin came in as the new uh, NASA administrator. Uh, he realized there were some additional things that needed to be addressed in addition to the spacecraft itself, like what launch vehicle is it going to fly on? Uh, what's the lander going to look like? And uh, so he put together a, a study team to kind of put put together thoughts for the rest of the program, uh, so to speak. Uh, we started the um, CEV, uh, pro we called it a project office back then, um, 2006, uh, maybe um, half a year, a year or so later, the Constellation program was born and and CEV was later named as Orion, became a project uh, working as part of um, con the Constellation program. And we down selected to a single uh, prime contractor of those two. And I think it was 2007 or so. Um, spacecraft configuration evolved over time. We added the Europeans as a partner, and I think it was uh, 2012 to supply a significant part of the service module known as the um, ESA service module or ESM. Uh, we've flown three times. Uh, we flew um, a lot of the early work was um, uh, kind of focused towards the abort systems that we would use. So in 2010, we flew what we called PA-1 or PAD abort-1, uh, the White Sands, uh, missile range, uh, White Sands missile range in 2010. 
2014, we had an orbital space flight called uh, EFT-1 that we launched on a Delta Heavy. And in 2019, we did our um, first ascent abort uh, flight test uh, out uh, uh, at Cape Canaveral. And uh, right now we're getting ready for our fourth flight, which will be uh, Artemis 1, and it's right around the corner. Very, very exciting. I see everybody's eyes light up when you said Artemis 1. And um, for those of you that are watching us today, you know, I started off 250 miles above the Earth and we're going further and further away. So let's talk a little bit about the Lunar Outpost, NASA's Gateway Program. And um, I wanted to go to Rod for a second. Can you tell us what the aspirations are for Gateway and how it fits in with Artemis? Absolutely. Um, one of the things we learned from Apollo is, is that you know that was a very sprint like mission you, you you had a very limited capability in order to achieve that goal with the technologies we had you know the, the first lunar lunar landing was only several hours before the crew had to get back in and come home and so the purpose of our program is to make a more sustainable approach to exploration artemis is attempting to do that with the major components. Orion being, of course, the, the crewed vehicle that gets the crew to the lunar vicinity, a lander that gets them to the surface, and Gateway, which orbits the moon and provides that transportation link between the crewed vehicle from Earth to the crewed vehicle that gets you to the surface. So by breaking up that transportation uh, loop, so to speak, each of those vehicles can specialize in their area of expertise and what they need to do and allows us more robust exploration of the surface of the moon. So with the gateway, we can leave a, a, an HLS or a lander docked for long periods of time and reuse it, which makes it sustainable. The gateway can transition its orbit to other inclinations, which means we can explore almost nearly any point or on the surface of the moon, whereas before we were very limited to equatorial type um, landing sites. And, and so therefore, the, the goal of Gateway is to create that platform. It's a base camp in lunar orbit to enable sustainable exploration. That was a, a wonderful, concise way of putting it. So uh, just to elaborate that a, a little bit more. So how will that help us with uh, upcoming Artemis missions as far as getting, getting boots on the ground um, on the lunar surface? Well, it, it, it allows you to bring the vehicles together. So the Orion can dock and, the, and so the gateway itself is composed of seven major components. It has a power propulsion element which is basically a satellite bus, which generates the power and does the attitude control of the stack and distributes power to the other elements. We have two habitable elements. One is made by Northrop Grumman called the HALO, and one is made by the ESA, um, our ESA partners called the IHAB. And these provide the living spaces for the crew. The key elements to these volumes in addition to living space are the ability to vehicles to dock to them. And so now we can have an aggregation point where we can bring in all kinds of future vehicles. We can bring in logistics, commercial resupply vehicles, future commercial uh, crewed vehicles, and of course the commercial lunar landers. So by creating this network of architecture and not single point designs driven by a very specific mission, we have a more flexible and robust uh, lunar exploration capability. Robust and it, it truly, it takes a village as, you, as we've heard from everybody. Um, I just wanted to take a step back for a second. So uh, Camille, uh, Leo is commercial. Leo is is very new to NASA, as you mentioned. And how how do you can you give us some some perspective on how it's preparing us for the Moon and Mars? Yeah. So as I mentioned, you know we so that it's really a, a step from the ISS, right? I talked about ISS being owned and operated by NASA, commercial platform being owned and operated by commercial, but we NASA are going to be one of many customers. And so we want to, one, maintain a sustained presence in low Earth orbit, right, as a nation. So that's one of our goals. Two, so we want to enable commercial marketplace. This really opens up commercialization and access to space for everyone, right? We started with the transportation systems, the CCP, the um, commercial crew program, the commercial resupply program as transportation systems commercially, but now we're working on the destination, the platforms, the commercial platforms. And so being one of many customers, we will still have needs in terms of wanting to do research in low Earth orbit. 
wanting to test out our ECLIS system for exploration, right? For as part of the Artemis program, wanting to still understand there are a lot of um, risk, human risk, right? Um, to it, flying our astronauts for long durations, our human um, missions to Mars, for example, there are a lot of risk we are still buying down from a human adaptation perspective. And so using these platforms to continue to do research in the area of human research is one of the big things, the big areas we'll be focusing on. Um, in addition to using it for other needs that we may have, um, you know, beyond technology, doing microgravity, life science experiments, biological experiments, doing earth and space science research like we do on the ISS, there will be capabilities on these commercial platforms for us to be able to do that, continue that type of research. Um, and so we're really excited to see what these commercial providers come up with. You know, we, we know that with commercial one, they're more innovative and they're more agile and nimble but also with competition, it drives some costs for, for us as NASA and as a country. And so we're really excited to see what designs they come up with and, um, you know, and to, to partner with them to enable this new capability coming online. That was a, a fantastic response. And, um, you know, one, one of the things that you truly mentioned was the uh, the platforms that we're using and the research in low Earth orbit. So, Ryan, I wanted to toss it back to you to talk a little bit about some of the um, uh, what stands out to you as being one of the most uh, exciting advancements being made to enable scientific scientific discovery um, aboard the International Space Station? What, what, is there something that you would like to touch on? Oh, yes. There's, I have lots of favorites. There's I always, a stupid question, I know. <laughs> that's not fair. Um, I always tell everybody on my team, find that one. Find that one thing that really gets you jazzed. And, you know, I could think through a whole list of even in the last five years, what we have figured out to do in space between microbe identification, where we used to have to return samples to the ground. We can now do that on orbit. Um molecular biology processes where we learned how to break, repair, and resequence DNA in space. You know, this, this comes into play, like Camille's saying, when we learn um, or when we have our crews way out there and they've, we, we need to repair damaged DNA caused by radiation or even when they come home. I'm at a conference right now and just today I heard a number of scientists talk about tissue chip experiments and aiding in the science of cell regeneration. And we are doing experiments on the space station right now where we're looking at growing flat tissues like skin or tubular tissues like our vascular system all the way to full up solid organs and how doing fundamental science in low earth orbit helps us do that um, really just to make life better on Earth. Better on Earth and then help us explore the moon and Mars. So there's there's like a triple whammy here, if not Ooh, more, sure. to deep space. Exactly. <laughs> it's just our universe is here to explore. And I see everyone smiling and nodding. And I wanted to take a minute. Uh, John, I have another question for you. So um, as, as uh, the, the manager of the history office, um, Share your perspective on the center's evolution and how it's preparing us for the moon and Mars. Okay, that's a big question, but I'll try to summarize it in just a few minutes. Uh, so I, let's go back to maybe where, when NASA was founded in 1958. About a month after that, they established something called the Space Task Group, and they were tasked with developing the first human spacecraft for, for the United States. That was the Mercury Project. And it was moving along. And then in, in uh, May of 1961, President Kennedy says, well, this is good. We've had we've now had a 15 minute suborbital flight, Alan Shepard's flight. But now we want to go to the moon and do it before the end of the decade. All of a sudden, everybody realized the space task group, you know, working in their offices at Langley Research Center. They just didn't have the facilities to handle that kind of massive project in that short time period. And so 
they had to establish, as you said at the opening, the Manned Spacecraft Center here in Houston. And that took a few years to actually build the center here at Clear Lake. In the meantime, they were working out of 14 different buildings in Southeast Houston, trying to make this whole project work, starting the Gemini program, working on Apollo. It was an evolutionary thing. They were literally, they brought about 600 people from Langley and they were hiring like crazy because they needed people to do this amazing job of getting us to the moon in less than 10 years. And, and really nobody knew how to do that. So they were writing the textbooks as they were building the buildings and figuring out what kind of training facilities they needed and, and how do you select more astronauts. And, and all those things were tasked to the Manned Spacecraft Center. And that evolved through the 1960s. And we went through the Gemini program to test out all the technologies that we would need to get us to the moon, the rendezvous, the docking, the spacewalking and so forth, and keeping people healthy for long enough that we can get to the moon and back. And so that was an evolutionary process. And, and once we landed on the moon, OK, mission accomplished, we finished that goal. It was time to move on to other projects. So the space shuttle came along. And of course, NASA, JSC in particular, had to adapt to that new program. It was far more complex. Nobody had ever built a reusable space vehicle like the space shuttle. So we needed to learn how to do that. So we used the facilities we already had here. We expanded upon them. We had to build larger training facilities, hire new astronauts. So again, it was a whole new level of doing human space flight. And then, of course, International Space Station came along. Yet again, we had to take on a new, you know, far more complex project, learning how to keep people going, in essentially 24-7 operations. We just really had not done that before. So that was a whole new process. So I think based on all that experience that we built up over the last 60 years, we are supremely well positioned to take on all these new projects that will take us out of low Earth orbit and back to the moon and hopefully beyond that in the next few years. So we have the we have the facilities, we have the people, we have the expertise, we have the knowledge. It's it's all in place. And from uh, from speaking to all of you, I also see the element of passion there. You guys are all very, very excited about this new era of exploration and discovery. So I wanted to open it up to the group a little bit. Um, I would love to hear from all of you, some of you, if you can share one thing with our viewers today about how JSC is preparing us for exploration and discovery. What, what From your perspective or the area that you work in, um, what would you say about that? Don't all answer at once. <laughs> Okay, well, I'll, I'll just jump in because it's kind of a continuation to my previous answer. And I'm going to jump off what Ryan said about the uh, the cell studies that are now going on on space station. I remember when I worked on Shuttle Mir, we did one of the first cell biology experiments trying to grow a cell culture aboard the Mir space station. And compared to what's happening today, it was relatively primitive. But even back then, we knew that it was just the start of something big, that eventually we could get to where we are today and move beyond that to actually build, we could actually build organs in, in microgravity aboard a facility. And so that evolutionary process is really what is gonna get us to moon and Mars, not just in the science areas, which I'm very familiar with, but also all the technology we built on the, the Apollo program to build Orion. We've now expanded to the commercial area, which is something we hadn't thought about five or 10 years ago. And that's probably gonna open up even more areas that we probably can't even imagine today. And, and that all of that will help us to achieve the goals of getting to the moon and then on to Mars. I, I would like to add to what Ryan said a little bit in the area of technology. You know, we've talked about 20 plus years of human habitation in space, and that's extremely important to understand what happens to humans living in microgravity away from where we evolved. But people, I think, also underestimate the technology and the importance of the technology. What that really means is we've had 20 years of operational life support systems and waste management compartments and power systems and communication systems. And those are extremely difficult things to build and operate reliably continuously while people are dependent on them to survive. And so the space station has given us that opportunity and we are applying all that to the next generation stations for gateway and then for vehicles to go to Mars. So we have a wonderful platform we are continuing to exploit with those technologies. The commercial partners are coming on and learn and absorbing that technology as fast as we can we can transfer it to transfer it to them. And then we're going to take that and use that for a gateway in order to 
start and, ex and extend that, that technology to the next logical place to be, and that's in lunar orbit, where we can safely still experiment with these technologies and figure out how to operate the, these vehicles, how to make them more autonomous, because when you go to Mars, there's many, many points of the orbit that you don't get to talk. You have to be autonomous and operate independently. And so I think for me, that's one of the biggest interesting changes over time is how we're moving these technologies forward over these different platforms and bringing in this commercial aspect to help us advance the exploration mission. And can I add to what Rod says, even in low Earth orbit, I mean, we are transferring the knowledge. I mean, up until now, it's <laughs> NASA's been the only <laughs> agency to build a US to build a space station. Right. And so in, to enable the commercial sector to be able to do the same thing, we have to transfer the knowledge. And so that's that's one of the things we're going to be doing over the next years. Right. Is really that trans that transfer of knowledge, the technology transfer um, so that they are able to. You know, and they will bring their own innovation, as I said, innovative solutions to it, um, too. And so that that combination is is a powerful one. I'll add um, to what all three of you said because it's all what I love about this entire panel is it's all connected. So, right, your question was how you know how does our history take us forward to the moon and Mars and JSC is this wonderful little microcosm that I feel like I was um, just really privileged to get to, to peek at in different ways when I was working um, for the center director over the last year and a half or so. But it's this little microcosm of people who are at one point so technically competent, we can do all of the things that my colleagues have said here, but also dreamers to think up of what's coming next. And, and it all comes in one place where you have these people just passionate to be a part of where we're going. And I think that's one of the highlights at JSC that kept coming up as I interviewed people over the last couple of years. Yes, so on Orion, um, so we're, you know, we're able to leverage those decades of experience uh, here at JSC to make uh, significant contributions. Uh, you know, we lead uh, the program office here out of JSC. A substantial part of the engineering is done uh, here at JSC. We do safety and mission assurance. Uh, we have FOD that leads uh, and executes the uh, flight operations, health and medical. Of course, we've got the flight crew office here as well. So we really got all the uh, really got all the skills necessary to run a complex program like Orion, uh, and it's because of the rich history that JSC has that we've got we've got that talent. Definitely, and I, I recall recently just seeing some of the the imagery of Orion stacked at the Kennedy Space Center Vehicle Assembly Building. So, Chuck, do you want to tell us a little bit about what we can look forward to? I know you mentioned Artemis One, but I know there's a bigger story to tell there. Sure, we're coming down the home stretch, uh, getting ready to fly Artemis One. Of course, Artemis One is a uncrewed uh, mission uh, to the moon. Uh, it's the first flight on the new uh, SLS heavy lift vehicle. Uh, the Orion spacecraft is fully fueled at service with all its fluids and gases, and it's it's pretty much ready to go. We were mated uh, to the SLS launch vehicle a couple of um, Weeks or so ago, we've done initial uh, spacecraft power on and health checks after that mating and everything uh, looks good. We'll be participating in more uh, powered testing in the coming uh, couple of months and um, looking forward to a launch um, probably uh, second week of February, I think is when our launch uh, window opens. So it'll be a long mission uh, at least. Uh, 26 days, uh, possibly 42 days, depending on the exact uh, day that we uh, get to launch. We'll be flying a very unique orbit uh, as compared to um, what Apollo flew. Apollo flew uh, a very low, a relatively low altitude orbit uh, close to the lunar surface and went around an orbit in about an hour or so. For us to, uh, to complete an orbit, it's more like a two-week 
orbit. So it's a much higher orbit. It's called a distant retrograde orbit or DRO. I'm sure you guys will um, hear about that. So it's um, anyway, it's going to be a very uh, unique mission. going to be very exciting flying the first production version of the spacecraft. It'll be our fourth flight, but the first full, pretty much full up spacecraft and, and on our real, uh, our real ride, our real heavy lift SLS vehicle. I get butterflies as you're speaking. So, and then it looks like, again, everybody here is getting those same butterflies. So, you know, I, I, I look back 50 years and you mentioned uh, flight controls ready, vehicles fueled, we're basically ready to launch, you know, and, and I think about the Apollo mission control, and I just wanted to take a minute. John, you were part of the team uh, in 2019 that was responsible for the restoration of Apollo mission control. That that project was a, a large undertaking, and if uh, any of you haven't had a chance to see it, I highly recommend you take a look. Um, every last detail has been thought about. But can you talk a little bit about that restoration project and the uh, the impact the Apollo program had at JSC? Well, sure. Uh, thanks for that question. It's it's a, it's a big one. Uh, obviously, Apollo was kind of the reason why JSC was built. It was to get us to the moon. That was the goal that was set by President Kennedy. And of course, the, you know, the mission control function was one of the ones established for for the manned spacecraft center at the time. And so that was controlled out of the mission operations control room or the MOKER for Apollo 11 over in, in uh, Mission Control Center. And that, that room was also used in the early days of the shuttle until about 1992 before it was retired. And so they made modifications from the Apollo configuration as we flew through the shuttle. There were upgrades made. And after it was retired, it kind of fell into some disrepair. And of course, with the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11 coming up, the idea was, well, we probably ought to restore this so you know when visitors come to see it it would look more like what they it will really would have looked like during apollo 11. and that's easier said than done because number one it was declared a national historic landmark in 1985 which means you can't just go in there and move things around and take things out it has to be done per a certain set of rules and so our office and it was primarily our chief historian dr uh, jennifer ross nazal who, who helped with that process to give the historical perspective on the control center help develop uh, kind of the historical dialogue about this, the story that can be told to people who come visit the center. So she worked closely with our historic preservation officer, Sandra Tetley, to make all that happen. A lot of other folks were involved too, so it's not to, it was a huge team effort. And it took a, you know, a couple of years to get all the consoles restored. And as you said, everything was literally restored back to the original condition as it would appear during Apollo 11. I mean, down to the armchairs, to the to the ashtrays, to just about everything in the control center is back to original equipment. And so when you go there, you kind of feel the whole experience of the moon landing. There's there's video playing, there's audio playing, so you feel like it's July 20th, 1969. And so it was our pleasure in our office to participate in that, in restoring that truly unique historic place to its original condition. And your response, John, gave me goosebumps. <laughs> um, I can't wait for 50 years from now when folks are looking back at, at Artemis and, and where, where we are on Mars and where we're exploring beyond Mars as well. So that that's just, just such an exciting project to be a part of. So I wanted to pivot for a second over to Gateway with Rod. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how Gateway is different from other NASA programs and what, what excites you most about this? That's interesting. Um, it's extremely different. And I would tell you um, in all the years, so all my early career, we have a very classical approach at, at uh, any engineering driven, I guess, agency where you, you define, you have a goal and a mission and you define your concept of operations, you derive your requirements, you flow those requirements into a logical engineering engineered elements, you, you divide those elements up and you get them built and then you plug it all back together and you get a spacecraft. And so it's a very top down driven approach where the design and the concept flows all the way through to the, the end item. And um, you, you end up with a very unique and custom purpose built vehicle, much like the shuttle was or the Apollo was, Mercury, all the, all the vehicles. Gateway is opposite day. Gateway is an attempt to take and aggregate commercial systems into a cohesive, useful spacecraft. So we started with 
of the commercial um, bus, which is a, actually it's a satellite bus. It's built by Maxar. They have 90 of these buses operating in space today. And the, it's the basis of their of their satellite. And it, it uh, provides, like I said before, uh, the ability to create, you know, generates power, it does attitude control, and it communicates to the earth and controls the overall stack. And so we started with that commercial bus, their 1300 series, and tweaked it to become a, a, the core element for our gateway, our foundational element. Then we go to Northrop Grumman, and we take their orbital um, resupply vehicle for space station, and we take that module and we modify it to the whatever extent's necessary to let it become a habitable element and permanently attached to the gateway as part of our space station, the first element. And then we have IHAP, and they come along and do the same thing. So what we were doing is instead of writing requirements that go all the way down to the to the thread size of, of, a, of a particular pieces of hardware, we we're writing the requirements as, as capabilities and working with commercial vendors and using their heritage systems as much as possible, and then trying to figure out how to plug those systems together. And so that is an extremely exciting opportunity. It's a challenge, it's a puzzle. You have to be flexible. You have to work with these different vendors um, to understand their system architecture and how you can make it work. And you have to adapt. You so you have to become very adaptable at how you are going to meet your mission goals and uh, the objective of your program. Um, I, I often uh, use anecdotes like it's like buying an engine for a Ford and the body from Subaru and a computer from someone else, trying to make it all work together. And yet it's a really exciting challenge. And I think that's the way the agency is moving. And as we transition from top down driven engineering to aggregation of commercial systems that are being promoted by in Leo and, and across the logistics and transportation systems, you know, that's how we're shifting our, our overall um, expertise in our management um, job. So. That's a, a really great way of putting it. I, li I liked your little anecdote as well, but um, we're getting close to the end of our time for, for our, our panel today. And I wanted to give each of our panelists to take a moment and uh, summarize their thoughts. Um, our, our topic today is um, how is 60 years of JSC propelling us forward to the moon and Mars? So if you could summarize your thought in one or two key sentences, uh, why don't we start with you, John? Okay, I guess I'm going to jump off of something that Ryan said about vision because in 1961, the area where JSC is now located was coastal prairie, basically. And somebody had the vision to turn that into the leading human spaceflight center and made that vision a reality. And, you know, eight years later, we landed on the moon. So vision is key in making sure you can implement your vision. And as exciting as the past 60 years have been and everything that we have accomplished here, I cannot wait to see what happens in the next 60 years. Thanks so much. What an inspiration, Chuck. Well, for me, it's uh, it's really just a humbling uh, experience to be able to um, be part of it. I mean, JSC is a fabulous institution, has a fabulous history, monumental missions and uh, the people that work here are not only uh, exceptionally talented, but of the highest integrity of anybody you can meet. So um, it's it's been it's really a privilege to work here. Uh, the institution and the people has made me a better engineer, made me a better person being part of it. So um, uh, it's really humbling to be part of it. Thank you. Truly appreciate that, Chuck. Come, uh, Rod. I would um, say that over 50 years, we put humans on the moon. In the last 20 years, we've had them in space. I can remember saying to folks that when we were talking about space station, one day there will be a generation that's never not seen folks in space, and that generation's here today. And in five years, we will start sustainable exploration of the lunar uh, vicinity. So I think that's an incredibly exciting time. JSC has been a uh, in the in a leadership role in all of those programs, and it it uh, will continue to do so. Camille, yeah. well, JSC is at the forefront of commercialization, right? We and when I talk commercialization, building economies, 
not just in Earth, Earth orbit, we are building economies on the moon too. We didn't talk about that, the commercial lunar payload services, right, project. And so JSC is at the forefront of that. We are leading the way for what it means to open up access to space for everyone through commercialization. And I'm just excited, I'm honored, I'm privileged to be a part of it. And it's just, I just, it's incredible. It's an incredible, incredible opportunity and privilege. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Camille. Last but not least, Ryan. There is probably not much I can add. Um, I resonate with everything everybody said. It is such an exciting time to be not only a part of the aerospace community, but, but JSC. Chuck, you're right, the people are phenomenal. Um, their passion, their minds, how they show up every day at work. It's just truly humbling and a privilege to be here. I don't think I've worked anywhere else where every single person uh, I've crossed paths with, including all of all of you today, has been so excited to work where they work. So I really, really appreciate everyone's time. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much to our panelists who help us look forward to the moon and on to Mars. Celebrating 60 years is definitely a milestone. And thanks so much for joining us today. Here's to 60 more years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Subscribe for more space. space, 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 space.